Hey friend, I am here to cordially invite you to the Ask Caitlin Anything live podcast being held on Friday, March 29th, 2024 at 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the Rural Woman podcast. This live podcast is being hosted by our friend and hostess with the mostess, Annabelle Morgan. She will be asking me all of your questions live. This is your opportunity for all of us to come and connect and celebrate the amazing stories of women in agriculture that have been shared over the past five years on the podcast. To register for this event, please head to the link in today's show notes or the link in our Instagram bio. I cannot wait to celebrate with you. Hi, I'm Caitlin Dubin, and this is the Rural Woman Podcast. I'm a first-generation farmer who married into agriculture. Born and raised in a city, I was so unfamiliar with where my food came from, but I was determined to figure it out. Through my journey into agriculture, I saw women who were strong but humble, often taking a back seat. To me, these women were leaders who deserved a seat at the table. I created the Rural Woman Podcast to share the voices of women in an industry whose stories often went untold. The rural entrepreneurs who live and breathe their work, full of grit and pride. We come here to share our stories, to be in community with each other, to be challenged and inspired, but most importantly, to be celebrated and to be heard. We may not all live, farm, ranch or homestead the same, but we are all connected. We are rural women and our stories are worthy of being told. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Rural Woman Podcast. Today is a very special day. Today is the fifth anniversary of the Rural Woman Podcast going live on the air, on the internet waves. What started out as something that selfishly I wanted to hear turned into a community of incredible women who are willing to share their stories and amplify the voices of women in agriculture. And here we are, five years later, 192 published episodes of the show highlighting these stories from women all across the world, playing in headphones all across the world, and showing the world that we, as women in agriculture, bring unparalleled value to this industry. Our stories matter. They always have, and they always will. And we are here to celebrate them. So on the anniversary of the Rural Women podcast, we are starting something a little bit new. We're going to take a look back. We are going to reshare some of the stories that have been told to us here on the Rural Woman podcast. So a compilation throwback, if you will. I did this all the way back on episode 27 and 28, which I believe was in 2019 or at least really early 2020. Since then, we have had so many incredible women share their stories of how they live their life in agriculture and live rurally. And we are going to go back and highlight some of our past guests in these throwback episodes. Looking back through these lists, there are women who have persevered and have been resilient. There are women who no longer farm the way that they used to farm or ranch but I know their stories had impact. And I hope that this is a solid reminder for those of you who have shared your stories on the show or want to share your story. Our stories are forever changing. And just because maybe we don't farm or ranch or homestead the same, or even at all anymore, there's been growth here. Whether the good, the bad, the ugly, I think it's a solid reminder for all of us to look back on how far we've come. So my friends, I hope you enjoy these 
new throwback podcasts that are coming your way. And thank you, my friends, for being here and for celebrating five years of the incredible stories of women in agriculture being celebrated on the Rural Woman Podcast. Good morning, Lauren. I'm so excited to talk to you on this microphone. We've been friends on Instagram now for a few months, and (laughs) I've been learning so much from you about goats and all of the things. But before I keep rambling on about how much I love all of your goats, tell the listeners a little (laughs) bit about who you are and where you're from. Yeah, sure. So I currently live in Northwest Arkansas. I was born and raised in California and actually lived in California for the first 31 years of my life. And I was a lawyer in private practice. I don't come from a farm family. I don't have a farming background, so to speak. And, you know, I could dig into this a lot about how I ended up being a farmer in Arkansas from a lawyer in California. And people always kind of give me sideways looks like, why are you here? How did you get here? This doesn't make sense. But I enjoyed private practice, but I just felt like that's not what I wanted to do for the next, you know, 30 years of my career. I kind of realized, which is odd that I didn't like sitting in an office all day. You know, I'd been a student, I'd gone to undergrad and then straight through law school. So that's seven years higher education. And I made it through that. But then I got into practice and I thought, I just don't like sitting at this desk for 12 hours a day. And the firm I was last at needed to let people go. And by the time, like I kind of had become pretty disenchanted with where I was in life. And So they let me go. And in hindsight, getting fired was the best thing that could have ever happened to me because it freed me up to explore things that I was really passionate about. And I hate to admit this, it's kind of embarrassing, but in CrossFit at the time, and I kind of got really into the whole paleo thing and thinking about how we should be eating, what's the right type of food to eat. And that took me into the rabbit hole of agriculture. And so, you know, people who do CrossFit try not to be one of those annoying people who always talk about it. And I kind of downplay it. But I really credit CrossFit and Paleo to opening my eyes to this whole concept of where does your food come from? Do you understand where it comes from, how it was grown, its impact on the environment, the quality of life for the animals? And so I found a master's program. It's actually an LLM degree, which is a master's for attorneys, a master's of law at the University of Arkansas. And it's expressly about food and agriculture law and policy. And I thought, this is my chance to take my legal education and apply it to something that I'm passionate about. So I packed up, drove to Arkansas, sight unseen for this master's, and I fell in love with the area. So Lauren, you said that the goat operation is quite new. Tell us more about how you got into that and why you chose goats. Yeah, the goat choice was really just because Anne has a lot of woods on her property. And this was about the time that I decided I was not going to move home to California. And I said, well, I should obviously buy some livestock and stay and start really trying to get into farming. And so I started out with two goats in 2016, I think it was. And I just bred them that year and they both kid in the spring. And now three years later, I've got 40 goats. And the way that they multiply so quickly, you know, and I've bought a few extra here and there, but they multiply really fast. And so we initially use them to just try and tackle some of the browse that Anne has on her place. She's got a lot of blackberries. She's got, I'd say about 30 acres of woods or so. And we've just grown it from there. And she's been really instrumental. You know, as you know, goats are hard to raise. They're a big challenge. And so having a veterinarian kind of helped me along the way to build this herd and figure out what genetics we want. And we're still playing with it. You know, I think I think I've got a really good health genetics line going on where they're very parasite resistant and they seem to be really hardy. But now what I'm trying to focus on more is carcass quality and larger carcasses, meteor goats, things like that. So I'm actually putting my Billy out on Tuesday, I think. And he's part Kiko, part boar. And so I'm adding a little bit of those boar genetics to try and see if I can get some bigger carcasses. It's predominantly a Kiko-based herd. So for my listeners who are unfamiliar with Courtney Williams, tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from. Okay, I am a mom of four. I'm married to Eric Williams. We live on a farm just east of Carstairs, Alberta. It's like just a little bit north of Calgary. And we're a cattle operation. And we are direct marketing grass-fed and finished beef. What made you guys decide to transition over into grass-fed, grass-finished beef? So we were just looking at it. Last year when we did it, we thought like, oh, this is just another way to make a little bit more money. And 
there's a need. We found like people were asking if they could buy cows directly from us. So we found like, we're like, why don't we just do it? We can sell halves and quarters and see if people go for it. And um, we were surprised by the response that we got. And then this year we were planning to do it again. We had six cows separated out and we just got thinking about it some more. And we're like, let's do it. Let's, if we're going to go after this, this is something that we can pursue and build a business from. And my plan was to eventually go back to work once our kids were a little bit older. And it was like, if we could build a business on the side that is bringing in enough income that I didn't have to do it, that would be amazing. So we're not there yet, but that's kind of the goal. And if we can do that, great. And if we can't and it just stays small, then that's fine too. Absolutely. And Mm -hmm. I think it's great what you said about there is a demand for this. So why not? If you have the space and you have the land, why not try it out? Put your hand in the game to see if you too can also do this sustainable grass-fed, grass-finished beef. If that's what people want, that's what, what farmers will give them, right? So Yes, that's right. So Amy, for my listeners who are unfamiliar with who you are, tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from. As you mentioned, my name is Amy Vanderhyde, and I'm from the Annapolis Valley, Nova Scotia. I grew up here, so I didn't go too far from where I grew up. I grew up on a beef farm, and life takes you places. I didn't go too far, but I ended up on a chicken farm. So different farming life, but that's me. Amy, what do you think some of the biggest misconceptions are in commercial chicken farming? The term factory farm comes to mind first. It's not such a common phrase here in Canada. It is, but it isn't. So people kind of assume that we're putting way too many chickens in a barn and they're in cages and they're force fed or they're fed hormones or they're fed antibiotics. And that's not true. They are in a barn, but that is so we can control their environment. And that is, you know, for their health and benefit because they do the commercial poultry chickens are bred to stay in that environment. So if you bought the same chickens and had them outside in your chicken coop in and out, they wouldn't grow as quickly. They wouldn't survive as well. They just weren't meant to deal with the outside environment. So these guys, they have free range of the entire burn, and we do have limits on how many birds we can have in the burn at once, and that is based on their weight at the time that they reach their target weight. So the barn looks really empty when they're really tiny, and then they grow into the space, and they still have lots of room to move around and eat and drink and, you know, basically do whatever they want. We use straw as bedding. They like to pick through that because there is sometimes some grain left over or, you know, bugs or whatever. And so they have all of that option. So the factory farm term kind of rubs me and probably many other commercial farmers the same way because it just kind of shines a negative light on what we're doing. And what we're doing is to the best advantage for the bird that we're raising. You talk about the environmental control. And I know that you guys have experienced some crazy weather this year, including a hurricane. So I could only imagine having all of these chickens outside during a hurricane. So they were nice and safe tucked in a barn. (laughs) They were nice and safe. And we have to watch our controls and such during weather events like that. We have to be aware of power outages because, of course, the temperature has to stay the same depending on where they are in their life cycle. Because if we have a major drop in temperature, you know, it causes health problems. And of course, the same goes if we have a major hike in the temperature. So making sure our fans are going and our heat is going and the ventilation is going the right way so that they're always healthy, even if we have that power outage. I mean, some people were out for over a week running generators and making sure that, you know, they're all of their livestock, whether they had chickens or cows or whatever, could be properly maintained during that weather event. And the same goes for snowstorms, windstorms, dramatic temperature changes. We're always, always on top of it because it does affect the inside of that burn. (laughs) 
for my listeners who are unfamiliar with Katie Daughter Pyle, tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from. Okay, so I grew up, um, well, my name's obviously, you just said it, Katie Daughter Pyle, and I am a third generation turned first generation dairy farmer in the state of Maryland. I grew up in Pennsylvania, so I actually grew up in Mill Hall, Lock Haven area. Nobody knows where that is. It's um, I grew up half hour north of State College, so Penn State. Didn't go to Penn State. None of us went to Penn State. Fun fact. Um, but uh, now reside in Maryland, and um, yeah, that's that's where I'm at now. Jess told me about you coining the phrase, ask a farmer, not Google. Can you tell us mm-hmm. more about how that came to be? Yeah, so I I get so sick of people going other places to ask where their food comes from. And I do a lot of public speaking. And my very first question when I start is, first I say, if you have a car problem, where do you go to? And the answer is usually mechanic. If you have an ear infection, who do you go to? Some smart-ass people will tell me WebMD, but most are like a doctor. And I'm like, then why? Are we not going to a farmer when we have questions about food? Why are we going to why are we going to Dr. Oz? Why are we looking at celebrities for these answers when they have never stepped foot on a dairy farm? And so I just I remember the the night that it came to me. I was just, I was sitting on the couch and I one of my posts and I think it was milking parlor. I did a Facebook Live milking parlor video and I was getting a lot of comments. And a lot of them were pretty positive, but then, you know, you always have the angry, hateful vegan activists that want to, like, kill you, literally. And I'm just like, what? I just, it's it's mind-blowing to me, because it's like, I know we're less than 2% of the population, but so many of us are out there trying to engage with the public. We're on social media. Maybe not all of us, but there is a good number of us, and we're doing a good job, but I don't think we're doing a good job as far as getting, getting out and which is hard for farmers, right? Because we can't, we don't usually leave the farm. And if we do, we don't go too far. Um, but I just remember coming to me, I'm like, gosh, darn it. Ask farmers, not Google. Like why? And I'm, I'm guilty of going to Google for things. I mean, I ask Google all the time, but usually if it's someplace that has a better source, I'm going to ask the source first because it's a computer you're asking. How about you ask the actual person? Absolutely. I know for me, coming from an agriculture background and then coming into the world of agriculture, it was completely mind-blowing to me. Just all of the things that I didn't know about where our food came from or how it was even grown. The advice of not going to Google is definitely good advice, not only for people not in agriculture, but also for people in agriculture. For my listeners who are unfamiliar with Andrea, tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from. So I am um, from Greenville, South Carolina in the U.S., obviously. Um, My husband and I live on a farm in the upstate of South Carolina. We have 54 acres um, and we run a, well, we both work full-time jobs, but then we also run a donkey rescue or a mule rescue, but predominantly donkeys. And that's what we do for our spare time and our hobby is run the donkey rescue. How did you get from just having two donkeys protecting your goats to a full on operation, d- operation, a donkey rescue? Um, my poor husband. So we got the two donkeys and that was an act of Congress to convince him to allow me to have two donkeys. I, when we moved to him, I begged and pleaded. Nobody has allowed me to have a horse in all these years. So I begged and pleaded for him to let's get, let's get a horse. And he says, no, 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 they're too much work. They're too much time, too much money. No, 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 we're not getting a horse. And I was like, well, donkeys are cute. And donkeys are kind of like horses. And I didn't know anything about donkeys at the time. So, um, I convinced him to get a donkey. And then I realized, well, donkeys are companion animals. So we need two donkeys. And then we had the, we had Jesse and Ringer, our first two donkeys, uh, with the goats. And then, good old social media. Uh, at the time, Facebook was still allowing people to rehome their animals. And there's a farm page, uh, in our area that somebody was trying to rehome this 20 something year old donkey that had been a petting zoo and he just looked terrible. And I was like, I'm going to go get this donkey. And I asked my husband, uh, can we get this donkey? And he of course said no. So one day while he's at work, I 
bought a horse trailer and drove down and picked up the donkey. And when he got home from work, we now had a horse trailer and a third donkey. Uh, and he just kind of realized that this is now his life. So then we rescued two more donkeys that came from a pretty bad uh, domestic situation. And we built a larger pasture. So we still had an empty pasture across the street. And I was like, well, we have five donkeys and we have two complete pastures. And I think we should start a donkey rescue because the more I started you know, paying attention to what's around us and watching um, social media and everything else. There's actually kind of a need for people to be able to rescue donkeys or place donkeys. Um, donkeys have grown in such popularity over the last few years as pets, and a lot of people get them, much like we did, and not know anything about them. And donkeys also can live to be up to 60. A lot of people have these older donkeys, and they're like, my gosh, we, you know, We can no longer care for them or we didn't realize what all was involved. Um, And so we take them and we get them up to speed and adopt them out. And um, why we became a, in the United States, it's called a 501c3 and it's a um, federally recognized nonprofit. So we got that in July and it has just taken off. And now we have um, eight donkeys today. I'm going to go pick up four more and we've got, couple of mules and three horses. So it's just all kind of snowballed since those first two little donkeys. Completely snowballed. And I didn't realize that donkeys lived until they were 60 years old. That's insane. Hey friend, I am here to cordially invite you to the Ask Caitlin Anything live podcast being held on Friday, March 29th, 2024 at 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the Rural Woman podcast. This live podcast is being hosted by our friend and hostess with the mostess, Annabelle Morgan. She will be asking me all of your questions live. This is your opportunity for all of us to come and connect and celebrate the amazing stories of women in agriculture that have been shared over the past five years on the podcast. To register for this event, please head to the link in today's show notes or the link in our Instagram bio. I cannot wait to celebrate with you. For my listeners who are unfamiliar with who Brooke Hickel is, please give us a little bit of information about who you are and where you're from. All righty. Well, my name is Brooke Hickel, and um, I live with my husband, Keith, and our three sons just outside of Enumclaw, Washington. Uh, We're in western Washington state, actually less than 30 miles out of Seattle. And uh, my husband, Keith, and I are first-generation ranchers. So a little bit of background on Keith and I, uh, when we met, he told me that he wanted to raise his family on a farmer ranch. And I thought it sounded like a great idea. (laughs) So I just pretty much went along with it. Did you ever think growing up that this is what you were going to do with your life? Oh my, definitely not. Definitely not. I remember my mom saying to me when I was in high school, um, I always had um, an interest in building design and construction. My dad owned a construction company. And so that was always an interest to me. And for many years, I thought I was going to be an architect. And then when I found out how many years of college I would have to go to to become an architect, I decided, nope, that's not for me. But home design was always was always just really a big thing to me. I always drew home plans when I was a little kid. And um, So my mom would say to me, I can see you, you know, moving to downtown Seattle and becoming a designer. Like, I remember those words coming from her. I don't really see you ever having a family or having kids. I can see you being a business person. (laughs) And what a change. So no, I would have, I would have never guessed that I would be where I am right now, that we would be where we are doing what we do. And specifically, even the area that we live in being less than 30 miles from Seattle, north to south. We are about midway between Seattle and Tacoma, just out towards the foothills at the base of Mount Rainier. So we are in an unusual area to be doing what we do. Uh, Beef cattle ranching is not popular here. And even in my, you know, visions of the future, if I had pictured that we would be ranching, it would not have been doing what we do right here. But on the other hand, it's, such a joy to get to do what we do here because we're so close to 
people in the big city and people in suburban areas. And I love the connection to those people because it's so outside the box for what most people around here are used to. Absolutely. And you have the connection, like you said, to the big city, but you also have that escape yeah. where you can run away from it all and be in yeah. your own oasis. On Absolutely. Ranch, right? I am so thankful to be right here where we are. We do all of our work out of our home. Our construction company has ran out of our home. All of our ranch operation is ran right here, here out of our place. So this week, my guys are gone hunting and I cannot remember the last time that I don't know if I've ever been home without anybody else being home. <laughs> um, so it's been a busy week, but also strangely uh, quiet to not have the house just running full speed like it usually is. Well, I hope you take some time and put your feet up and like have some <laughs> popcorn or wine or whatever it is that Thank you love. You. And just take Thank a breath. <laughs> So Kristen, tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from. Okay, well, I grew up in southern Alberta or southwestern Alberta, pretty close to the Montana, BC borders, like we're pretty tucked in here. My husband has also grew up here. So we met in high school. We actually grew up, he's one town over from me. We were born in the same hospital. He's one day older than me, but we were born in the same hospital and we were in the little nursery together, but we didn't meet till high school. And then we, yeah, we pretty much been together since the beginning of grade 10. <laughs> After high school, we got married and we moved to the city for a little while while he was in school. We were there for about six years in Lethbridge. And then he got a job out at, we have a gas plant local to us. So he got a job at the gas plant. So we were able to move home, be closer to family and that's when we bought five acres and we dove like headfirst into the homesteading world and just fell in love with the animals and nature and being close as we are to um, Waterton Lakes National Park, just being outdoors and with nature and raising our family here. And it's just been the last few years have been a whirlwind <laughs> of adding more animals and gardening and farming and just a whole new world for us. But we're just so blessed to be in this community and this part of the world. So I want to talk more about your cows. I think Highland okay. cows are probably the most beautiful creatures that I have ever seen. They, they are, are so, so cool. cool. <laughs> they are just so cool. What made you and your husband decide that that was the breed of cattle that you wanted to raise? I think it started when we were getting more self-sufficient and wanted to have a beef cow. We kind of started looking at like different breeds and the one that kept coming up for like small, easy to handle breed was a Highland cow. And so it just kind of like <laughs> exploded from there. We actually went on a trip to Scotland and saw them for the first time, like in the Scottish Highlands, which is like the coolest experience to like see them in their natural habitat and everything. And just the quality of the meat with Highlands is like they're a premium cow. So the beef of a Highland cow has lower cholesterol, lower fat, higher omegas than a typical beef breed, even grass fed. They just have a higher quality of meat. And the way they put on fat is different than other beef cows as well because of their long hair and stuff. They don't put on the thick fat layer through winter that other beef breeds do. So their meat is more marbled, making it just lower fat content and a healthier meat all around. So that was one of the things that really drew us to them was just like the quality and the health, like a higher health standard of meat than other beef breeds. And they're beautiful to look at. <laughs> they, are. <laughs> they are. So typically how large do Highland cattle grow then? So they are a smaller breed, so they and a slower growing breed. So they do take longer to reach maturity than a like an Angus cow would. So typically, like a, a cow would probably be eight hundred to a thousand pounds, where a bull would probably be twelve to fifteen hundred pounds. So they are a little on the smaller side, but it just makes it more easy to manage. For my audience who is unfamiliar with Nicole Masters, tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from. Well, your listeners might pick up a, a slight accent. So I'm New Zealand born, 
I'm an agroecologist, so I focus on whole systems in agriculture. I've been working in the field for over 20 years, and I'm mainly based in the U.S. these days, so I spend most of my time in North America working with ranchers and farmers. How did you become the globally recognized soil advocate and agroecologist that you are today? <laughs> well, it wasn't really the intention. I certainly didn't set out thinking, right, you know, I'm going to you know, global recognize something or other. But I think, I mean, it's felt to me for a long time that there's been this real trying to drag soil health into the forefront of people's minds and particularly in New Zealand, just finding I was coming up against rules, like working with sector groups, beef and lamb and the wool industry and, and horticulture, and they just weren't interested, just not interested in soil health at all. I think in New Zealand there's this assumption that, oh, you know, we're doing just fine because they get rain <laughs> and they're very young soil. So when you look at the destruction of New Zealand soils, what was happening here in the 30s in the US and Canada really didn't happen in New Zealand until the 50s and 60s. So we're sort of 30 years behind and really waking up to the destruction of soil which is happening quite rapidly in New Zealand. And so I think it was stepping out of those confines of the New Zealand context because, yeah, it did feel like it was hitting walls and starting to work in Australia and finding uh, catchment management groups and land care groups that really were engaged with soil health and really did understand how vital it was. And then I came to the US in 2013 and started working with ranchers here and just working with really progressive, outward-looking producers who, you know, caught the soil bug. And now it's just exciting to see that a topic that many consider probably quite boring and not very sexy and not all that interesting, people are like, whoa, wow, really? You know, there's all of these different aspects to it. And so I think soil finally has, you know, light up people's lives and I'm in the right place for the first time. So I'm going to have to go find something else to do, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's funny that you say people don't think soil is sexy because I am married to a person who thinks soil is the sexiest thing. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And I think once you do get hooked, you do realize, oh, wow, you know, it's, it is actually, for me, certainly more exciting than rocket launches or, you know, going to Mars or anything like that. It's that it's such a new frontier of discovery and there's so much about it that ties into you know human health and animal health and I think if you're concerned about greenhouse gases or concerned about you know climate variability or water quality or food health or human health or you know like everything comes back to soil health so I think it's non-political and it does appeal well personally I think it should appeal to everybody even if you're in the cities absolutely it's so complex and it comes back to the soil with anything, whether you're a farmer, or whether you live in the city, anything like that. So, For my listeners who are unfamiliar with the Kristen Graves, tell us a bit more <laughs> about yourself and where you're from. Well, first of all, I like that it's the Kristen Graves. So yeah, I'm Kristen. I am a fifth generation farmer. I grew up just southeast of Atasquan on our farm. I have a market garden. I run a CSA, and I'm also trying to learn the ins and outs of conventional grain farming from my dad and my grandpa, and um, we still have a pretty functional family farm out there. That's great. Kristen, you were recently featured on a documentary called Picture. Tell us more about that. That was a really cool experience. It was also incredibly humbling to be a part of that project. I feel like there's so many women in the world who are farming and are trying to make advances in agriculture. And the company that did this, the people that sought me out, like they chose me. And I found that to be one of the most validating things about this big shift in my life. And I got the call to um, be a part of it. Pretty much, it was about a week after I left my job. So I was kind of freaking out and kind of scared that this was, you know, a big risk. And all of a sudden, these people were saying that your story is, is so interesting. We want to learn more about it. And it was just a really, it came at the most incredible time, like the best time that it could come up. And so the documentary mainly follows three of us. And each of us is at a different stage in our farming life. So 
I'm pretty new to the game coming back to it and trying to figure out the ins and out, outs of how I want my future to be on the farm. Um, Lynn, another girl who was involved, she has been running their grain farm and um, I believe they have a feedlot as well. She's been running the show for a number of years now and is doing an incredible job of it. And Sue, who's the other lady, she has been a farmer for quite a long time. And she tells her story of how much it took for her to be the the main farmer in like the 70s when that was completely unheard of. And she had to fight with banks because they didn't see her as um, anything more than, you know, a farm wife, not the actual farmer. So it was really cool to get to see my story along these two other incredible women. I am excited to get to know you a little bit more, Amanda. So for my listeners who are unfamiliar with you, tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from. Well, I'm Amanda Griffey, and I am at least sixth generation farmer. That's at least how far back we can trace it. And I'm married to my husband, Thomas. He is a third generation farmer, and we live in east central Indiana, right along. We're just about 10 miles from the Ohio state line. And we farm with my husband's family. We have two children that we farm with my husband's family. And it's his two brothers and their families and his dad and stepmom and then his grandparents. And we all live within a six mile radius on the farm. And we have corn, soybeans, wheat, and hay. And then we raise beef cattle as well. So was there ever a time in your life that you thought that you were going to do something with your life other than agriculture? Not really. I always knew that I would be involved probably in some way, shape or form. It was just something that I always enjoyed. It was kind of, you know, bred into me, I think. And we laugh. I have a younger sister and she was the domesticated one and I was not. So I was the one out helping work on equipment and helping take care of livestock and do that sort of thing. And I think I always just knew that I would be somewhere involved in agriculture. I did get into showing horses and stuff as I got older. And I figured that would be my path that I would stay with you know, in the equine industry. And I did for a good while, but things kind of changed after my husband and I met and then it was back to the family farm. So those farmers are darn charming, aren't they? (laughs) They sure are. (laughs) I don't know what it is about them, but they sure are charming sometimes. (laughs) Thanks for listening to the Rural Woman Podcast. The Rural Woman Podcast is more than just a podcast. We are a community. A huge thank you to the Rural Woman Podcast team, audio editor Max Hofer, and admin support from Kim & Co. Online. A special thanks to our Patreon executive producers, Sarah Reedner from Happiness by the Acre and Carrie Munven from Laystone Farms. To learn how you can become a Patreon executive producer or other ways to financially support the show, head on over to wildrosefarmer.com to learn more. Be sure to hit the follow or subscribe button wherever you listen to the podcast to get the latest episodes directly on your playlist. And if you are loving the show, please be sure to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other platform that accepts ratings and reviews. You can connect with us on social media at The Rural Woman Podcast and with me at Wild Rose Farmer. One of the best ways you can support the show is by sharing it. Send this episode to a friend or share on your social media. Let's strengthen and amplify the voices of women in agriculture together. Until next time, my friend, keep sharing your story.